We are hot, Ellie. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another beautiful Sunday night here in Cuenca, Ecuador. We just had an intense storm, which was pretty cool. It's awesome seeing it come over the clouds. This is episode number 32 of Beyond the Court. Ellie, when I wrote that down, number 32, I couldn't believe it because it's much more than that. But what athlete jumps out at you when you think of number 32? Oh, there's so many of them over the years, but probably Magic Johnson, you know, I, I, of course, yeah, you know, from our era, that's was. what we're going to go to most of the time. But there's been a lot of good 32s in there. There has, but Magic, as I wrote that down, I just thought of Magic. So yeah, anyway, absolutely. you know, Elliot, it's good to see you always, buddy. I know you got a hey, nice buddy. workout in. And, uh, you know, tonight's guests are, are, you know, I think pretty interesting. We're going to have um, the three of the four USAR Board of Director candidates because they're going to be... Uh, there's another election that's going to be starting tomorrow for a month. I'll have uh, Stuart Solomon explain the process. He's going to be on with Carolyn Vasquez. I believe it's her first time running. Uh, and Todd Boss, who we've had on the show. And then uh, after we're done with them, we're going to go to TJ Baumba from the LPRT, representing tonight, Ellie. Nice shirt. Yeah, it looks good, buddy. Good job. Yeah, thank you. You know what? So do you know much about the process, about the voting process or... You know, we've talked a little bit about it. You know, you've uh, you've uh, mentioned some things over the last year and a half or so here with COVID, especially, you know, discussing racquetball as much as we do during this time. So um, I, I never sought it, you know, was, was seeking any position. So I, it's one of those things that I didn't learn a ton about. My dad's talked to me a little bit about certain processes within the U.S. national team over the years. So, you know, I have some knowledge, but uh you know, it's nice to have these uh, these individuals on to just uh, have a moment to to talk about racquetball and and uh, their platform, and then uh, move on to TJ and talk a little bit about women's professional racquetball. Yeah, we will. We'll, now, will you vote? Will you go on to our two sports and put a vote in or not? Honestly, I usually do. Yes, I do. Oh, do you? I do. Okay. Yeah, I do. Yeah. That's yeah, you know. No, I won't. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. You know, it's uh, usually I know the people involved a little bit, and some I don't, okay. and so I I read the little blurbs that the USA racquetball gives, whether it's on the, um, you know, Oh, I guess, I guess email blasts that come out and, and, uh, and here and there, maybe going to the magazine online or receiving the magazines in the past. So uh, I stay up to date for the most part, but you know, not too closely, not remembering a lot. Uh, so, uh, you <laughs> know, they, I know, I know this, a couple of them. <laughs> could this, could tonight change your vote or maybe sway your vote? Yeah. I was thinking about that earlier. That's a good question. Um, Thank yeah, you. maybe so. Maybe so. You know, it's a uh, uh, it's an opportunity for for us to actually hear the and see the people in, instead of just reading something about them. So it's great, you know, and uh, I'm open minded for sure. Todd Boss seems like a lock, uh, but, uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, we'll see. We'll hear we'll hear from him tonight and, uh, you know, people will be voting pretty soon here. So uh, it's a good opportunity. Also looking forward to obviously the talk with TJ. And, um, you know, talking a little bit about pro racquetball. I know they're getting ready to go back to Kansas City here pretty soon. They got the uh, Denver stop coming up as well. So they've got some some things going here in the next couple of months that they're preparing for. And that's better than nothing. And uh, talking about obviously going forward after the summer summer break and maybe even through the summer with outdoor and stuff like that. So. Uh, yeah, we'll, let's de get on we'll definitely. Well, yeah, we will. We're going to get on to you it. We're, gonna, we're also going to talk about the statement that was released by LPRT. And, mm -hmm. you know, we'll have it up here and, you know, we'll discuss that. But. We're going to take a quick 30 second break. Scotty Mack, I believe, has a commercial queued up. And then we'll be right back with the four candidates, Carol, uh, three candidates, Carolyn Vasquez, Stuart Solomon, and Todd Boss. So we'll be right back. All right, we're back and we have three of the four USAR Board of Director candidates. Uh, Terry Rogers, Ellie, as you know, is the fourth mm -hmm. candidate for two positions and Terry had prior commitments, so she couldn't make it. Uh, Stuart, hello, Carolyn, hello, Todd, good evening. Hello. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Beyond the Court. You know, Stuart, I'm gonna start with you. You are the senior board member for USA Racquetball. Um, why don't you first tell us 
tell everybody a little bit about the process of how one is selected to be on the slate or, or to be voted on as, as you guys and, and ladies are about to be voted on here this month. Sure, thanks. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, I guess senior, I'm only, I'm not even two years onto the board. My two year anniversary is in May <laughs> and that's why I'm up for uh, the election um, to fill. There's two vacancies that are out there and there are four uh, nominees on the slate. And to get on the slate, there are people like us that submitted letters of intent. And then your favorite subject, Sudzi, there's a committee that talks about all of the, the uh, nominees or all the people that submitted letters of intent. And so they go through that process. They read the letters of intent. They do some research. They do some interviews. And from there, they put a slate together. And then the slate comes to the board. And then the board votes on whether to accept the slate or not. And then once the slate is accepted, uh, the announcement goes out at the right time. And then the vote happens. And the vote is coming up uh, tomorrow, starting March 1st. And when does it end, Stuart? The end of March. OK. All right. So you know, we, we, we thought about, we wanted to have you all on and, and really just tell us why we should vote for you. You know, I mean, quite frankly, I, we do know it's, it's you guys are volunteers. You ladies are volunteers. Um, you know, you're putting your time in. Todd, looks like you already work in Washington right there, so, which you do, but we'll get back to that. Uh, so ladies first, Carolyn Vasquez, where are you from? <laughs> and tell the racquetball friends, family, and world why we should vote for you as a board of director member. Somehow I knew it was going to be ladies first, and I was ready for that. <laughs> well, hello, everyone. Um, this is Carolyn Vasquez from Chicago, Illinois, hailing from the great Midwest. Um, we're under a thaw right now, so the weather is really warm. So we're, we're happy people right now. Um, mm -hmm. First of all, let me say thank you guys for allowing us the opportunity to share our thoughts and uh, reasons why we'd like to be elected to the board. This is a great platform. So Sudzi, Ellie, thank you so much. I kind of grew up playing racquetball, looking at you guys play. So this seems kind of full circle for me, but I'm excited. Um, to answer the question really quickly as to why I would uh, be honored to serve on the board or why you should vote for Vasquez um, is in part because I really see a vision for the future of the sport. I do recognize that we're at a crossroads and there's a, a lot of important things going on. Um, some things that I feel are above my pay grade, so to speak, and some things I feel like I can really dig in. I'm one of those people that says, instead of complaining, come up with a solution, grab a weapon, take a post kind of thing. So I felt that one, as a female player, I wanted to have an impact on the sport. I wanted people to see uh, more women involved. As much as there are women involved behind the scenes, I wanted to pitch in and help. I want to be a part of the next generation. I work here in Illinois currently with the junior uh, Illinois racquetball team, JTI. Hi, JTI. Um, we've got a great group of kids. We have been building and growing, and there's so much. Coach Marion, Cheryl, everyone out there, hello. Um, and to the kids who put in so much work. I think that it's such a positive thing and being invested in the next generation is helpful. And then also looking at creative things that we can do, being a part of the conversation, at least. I feel bringing my expertise in what I've done in fundraising and working with nonprofits and just a, a lifetime of experience in racquetball, I feel like I have a voice and I'd like to share that and bring a fresh set of eyes. Um, in working with juniors, I see the excitement in their faces and while there is a, a part of us that still holds on to the classic racquetball, um, there's a new energy that has to come on to really get the kids hyped up about what we have to offer. So while we're building, I always say, if you build it, they will come. And while there's so many people on the board currently working hard, um, I feel like they're building it. And I wanna come and uh, give my expertise, give my, uh, decision uh, in how things should go across the country, and especially when it relates to the next generation. That's where the future of the sport lies. Um, sponsorships, uh, technological advancements in terms of video recording, uh, and the tournaments and the types of tournaments that we offer are all very key important things. 
But if we don't have people kind of digging that trench for the future, making it important, then the things that we're working on now won't mean anything. So um, there's so many different angles to come from, but I really believe wholeheartedly in the future of the sport coming from the kids. And I want to be a part of that. You know, I really want to bring what I have to the table. So I'm honored to be a part of it and honored to have this opportunity to at least share me as a person and a racquetball player with everyone else. So thank you very much. Great. Thank you. And Todd. Mm. Hey, um, thanks for the opportunity here, guys. Uh, it's good to be back on the show. Um, my name is Todd Boss. I am from uh, the Washington, D.C. area, hence the, uh, the background. I actually live in a town three hours south of Lynchburg, Virginia which is better known as being the home of Liberty University. Uh, that's probably what the town is most known for. Um, I'm currently on the board. I was selected to fill a, a vacancy uh, that expires in May. So I was uh, just popped on in December to fill, to fill a short term need. Uh, but I did also apply to run for election. And uh, in my statement, if, which I think the statements are all available and for anyone who's interested, you should probably go read the statements. Uh, I focus on a couple of things in particular. Um, I come to Racquetball, for those of you who don't know what I do, I run, I'm the creator of ProRacquetballStats.com. And so I bring uh, a, a technical focus, an IT focus to the sport, you know, and, and trying to figure out, you know, what, what we can do uh, leveraging technology or the, the site that I've built, uh, furthering the use of social media, et cetera, et cetera, to try to promote the sport. In my statement though, I focused on a couple of things in particular. First, I think that uh, we need to focus on outdoor. You know, USAR acquired uh, war a couple of years ago and to be completely frank, has done little to nothing with it. And I think that that has left a lot of outdoor players frustrated, irritated, uh, or worse. I think that, uh, so what I've been trying to do, and that's one of the committees that I have been working with uh, uh, even before the time I got onto the board. Um, I think we need a clear, uh, we need to really focus on a clear transition path for the U.S. Open. You know, Doug Gannam has done a great job for 25 years, but he's retiring. That is such a key or a key event in our sport. And I think that we as a board and as an organization need to make sure that that event continues. Uh, those are the two main things that I focused on in my, in my kind of in my statement. You know, in addition, there's all the underlying issues. There is uh, funding issues with the sport. There is a, a need to continue to promote juniors. There's a need to work with the chains and make sure that we we, uh, we don't lose courts. You know, all of those things are, are absolutely there and no less important than the things that I just mentioned. But those are the things that I focused on. Thank you, Stuart. All right. I start off the election conversation. I guess I kind of round up the, uh, the platform section of the elections. Um, Carolyn and Todd made some great points on what the, the board does. Having been on the board for now a, uh, you know, a year and a half, almost two years, about three months short of two years, um, it's, been, it's been an experience and it's been a ride. I came into it thinking uh, I'd have a lot of opportunities to bring about a lot of change and then COVID came and changed it for everybody. And so there's been a lot that I've been able, that I have left on the table uh, that I haven't been able to get to. One of the things that I really wanted to bring to the board was that voice from the people. Um, having been in the, so I'm from Philadelphia originally, and I'm now living in Boston. When in Philly, I was on the Pennsylvania State Board, and now I am one of only two left on the Massachusetts State Board as we try to organize, hopefully at some point, a New England Racquetball Association. Um, and so being on that side of the fence, I really wanted to understand what was going on on the other side of the fence within the bigger organization. So I had always had aspirations of getting onto the board and I found my way onto the board recently through an appointment. And that appointment was uh, similar to, to Todd. And that appointment was very key. It really gave me an opportunity. I, I got down there a day before the actual board meeting and helped get organized all the information for that original board meeting that I had to uh, attend to having no information or insight about what was gonna happen, I just helped organize it. And that's probably one of the big, um, big tools that I bring to the table is the organizational skills um, and that outreach. And so I always ask, it's funny, um, I don't know if we've said it yet with Todd on the board, uh, but there's a lot of times people say, okay, I'm gonna do a, I'm gonna pull a steward here and ask what's the action here, right? Every time we come up with a great idea, I'm always asking, okay, what action can we take to implement that idea. 
Um, I created an action log before COVID when we had a bunch of things that we wanted to get through. And unfortunately, we haven't been able to get through many of them uh, because of the situation we're in. And so it's all about, we can do all the talking at the board meetings and we can do a lot of um, strategizing, but if it doesn't come to actions and taking actions and documenting them and holding people accountable for them, then it's gonna be for nothing. And it's just gonna be a bunch of hot air in a, in a now a, a Zoom call. So uh, that's really why I'm, I'm running is to really um, take up the mantle that I've started to carry and, and keep running with it. And hopefully when this COVID is in the rear view, we can get back on the courts and really get back in the juniors onto the court. So it's, there's a lot of areas of opportunity and, and we just need to get together and, and take some action. All right, thank you, Stuart. So this, Terry Rogers made a post today and she couldn't be here, but I'm just gonna read what she had wrote. Uh, the USA Racquetball Board of Directors election site opens March 1, and I was selected as one of the candidates for the 2021 slate. If elected, this would be my second term, and I feel my work is not yet done. This has been a challenging year, to say the least, and I anticipate the racquetball family will survive and be stronger, as we have already shown. When the site opens, please take a few minutes to read the candidate bios. And she lists obviously where you know where to go see the bios um so yeah that's great and and, and i agree uh I, I know all of you personally uh Stuart, we got a chance to work together todd we've known each other forever carolyn we had a great conversation at starbucks in las vegas so yeah. uh, you know i'm I, I have to ask a question now um you know and, and this is for everybody so this time we're going to start with todd all right todd what do you believe is the single most critical issue that USAR needs to address dollars. Say again, money, money, Carolyn. Mm, repairing relationships, like a rebranding almost. Stuart. Todd knows where I'm coming from with money. Cause I love the fundraising committee, but I, I think um, juniors is probably the single, the single thing that we really need to focus on. Ellie, I know you, you had something there. Yeah, you know, you, you know, at the beginning of this, I, I applaud all three of you for just uh, wanting to help out, wanting to be involved in the sport at the, uh, you know, in USA Racquetball. So, um, you know, I, I wish you the best in this in this upcoming vote and all that and all that and, and uh, congrats for just being involved. So um, you mentioned, though, at the beginning of it, just the process a little bit and because and, I don't follow it as closely as you might think. But uh, how many how many are seeking the position? before the committee gets a hold of the, you know, like, and then decides to, you know, condense it down to a certain number. Like, are there, are, do you guys know, do you, do you, do you know if there's a large number of, of uh, racquetball people that are seeking out these two, two positions? Um, I'm not sure if I understand the question you mean outside of the, so, the one. So, two. yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you said that there's a committee that then votes on uh, the applicants okay. essentially to be on the board, to be voted in. And so you, you guys made it through that process here, right? And we're going to vote uh, who for the two spots. But how many others are, are there that are seeking these positions? I mean, is it, is it a small number and, and they're just, okay, we're, we're accepting these and then we'll have a vote on, on the people such as yourself that want to be involved and, and take, these, take these roles on? Or is it a large group that's then condensed down to, to uh, you four? It might be a steward question, though. Um, I don't think I'm privy to the number of applicants that were in there. You know, I just received word that um, I was selected as one of the candidates. So maybe that may be a more directed question for someone existing there. Yeah, um, I'm almost glad I don't know. I, that might have made me a little bit more nervous. I just I really felt um, like I wanted to be a part of it. And there's so much change that, you know, hey, we can sit back and complain or we can, like I said, get involved and try to make a difference. Um, you know, mm -hmm. I agree, the kids are the future, but there's a lot of work that has to be done. And I just think, like you said, Stuart, people who are gonna get in there, be held accountable and mm -hmm. try to take care of that business. Mm -hmm. it, 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 like domino effects. So to answer your question, I think maybe, I don't know, Stuart, would you have a little bit more insight on that? Yeah, I was going to say, I don't think Caroline or Todd are either going to have uh, the knowledge. I mean, maybe Todd has some insider information. I don't know. Um, but uh, as, far as, the, <laughs> just a little, um, as far as the board goes, we just get the slate to vote on. So the election committee, I was on the election committee previously. 
I wasn't able to be on the election committee this time because I'm running. So I can't right. be on there and, and vote for myself, right, to go on the slate. So it, it goes to that committee. Uh, what that number was, uh, I don't think it was more than 10. Um, mm. I don't know what the number is, but I don't think it was more than 10 that was that was um, submitted to the committee. Interesting. So, okay, just so, so everybody understands the process. So the committee, Stuart, my favorite, a committee decides who the members and players can vote for to be the board representatives. That is correct. Okay. And of the four of you, there's only two slots open, right? Stuart, I know you're currently on the board. Obviously, Todd, I know you were appointed. So no matter how this plays out, March 31, two of you are in, two of you are out. Is that correct? Two of us are in by election and two are out by election. Yeah. Uh, there's also, if you go through the bylaws, there's also an appointment process, which is how Todd got on and, and, and I got on. So Todd got on through... Uh, someone vacating, a position vacating, and there's a couple appointments that are left available as well. And so uh, there's an executive appointment. And so we are able to get the, the executive committee is able to appoint. And that's how I was able to be appointed onto the board two years ago. All right. Well, I mean, Todd, let's end with you. Is there anything you'd like to say before we go to the players, fans, members, supporters, and relationships out there as to why they should vote for you? Did Todd freeze? The guy with the, no. the IT? <laughs> Todd, come guy? back. He looked like it. <laughs> wow. All right, so Carolyn, anything else you want to add before we let you go? Well, you know, there's a lot of work to be done. I think that together as a, a country, you know, it sounds kind of cliche-ish. We can make a difference. We just have to tackle each problem at a time. Um, I do believe in the future of the sport, and I just think, Vote for Vasquez. I've got the energy and the enthusiasm and a fresh set of eyes. I'm all about the future of the sport. So vote for Vasquez. <laughs> Stuart? Where did Todd go? We lost him. I'll see if I can <laughs> talk slowly and long enough to see if we get, get him back in. Um, <laughs> uh, so first and first off, I just want to let everybody know there's a big announcement coming out tomorrow um, on Real Racquetball. I'll just put that real, real quick plug in. Um, it, huge news. Um, but as, as far as the election goes, um, I just, I just ask that the members actually please go in, in and vote. Um, you know, I would love the, the vote. I hope that I have, um, people's, um, uh, the faith of, of people to continue doing the job. Um, there's, there's a lot of work to do, like Carolyn said, um, and some of it starts with, people that aren't on the board, just members, just players, just go out and get a friend on the court. Um, you know, it's one of the things I did in um, the National Racquetball Month of February a couple of years ago. I grabbed a friend on the court and then they said they were going to bring their wife onto the court. And so then I had them both on the court. So if we can bring one person on and have that person bring somebody and have each of them, all of a sudden it starts snowballing and we start getting more people interested in, in being on the court and spending that time. And, and that's where, that's where the, 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 the blood and sweat will really happen, bringing people onto the court. Todd, before we lost you, uh, is, is there, <laughs> no worries. Anything, anything you want to say before we let you go here? No, like uh, just, to, just to mirror Stuart, I, I think that the, the, the best thing that we can do is to have a, a healthy electorate, you know, everyone participating. You know, this is the board of directors for, you know, the United States Rackwall association so i'd hope that all the members who have a vested interest in how the board determines you know the priorities the spending the direction the decisions that is, you know this is this is your opportunity you know we're the representatives that are offering to speak for you and to drive the direction of the org and the sport in many ways so please read the read the profiles and vote Great. We, we will do that. We appreciate your time tonight. And, uh, you know, we're Ellie and I will definitely get out and vote. and We'll definitely touch more on the topic this these next few weeks. So uh, but we're not going to tell you who we voted for. We want to get two votes. So, so Stuart, Todd, Carolyn, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, and, uh, we, we, we will see you soon. We will see you soon. And we're going to take a quick 30 second break and we'll be right back with TJ Baumel from the LPR team. Bye, thanks. Bye. Thanks.
We're back with TJ Baumbach from the LPRT. TJ, what is going on? It's great to see you and great to have you here tonight. Thank you, Sudzy. Thank you, John, for having me. It's nice to be here. Nice shirt. Thank, thank you. I got, I got the shirt. I'm representing the ladies, which you know my wife loves. So, uh, you know, tell us what's going on. There's, there's a lot of good things. You know, let's get right to it. What does the LPRT have going on? There's some events coming up. Go ahead. We do. We, um, so we're going to start with Greenville, South Carolina, the Sweet Caroline Open, and that is a recurring event for us. Usually in January, we will be the end of April, beginning of May. That'll be a Grand Slam again this year uh, for the ladies. It's an incredible event. It's also a fundraiser. They pick a, a different charity each year uh something near and dear to their hearts um they do a lot of good they raise a lot of money and they also spotlight the tour which is really special for us they have a banquet and everything like that greenville south carolina that's a great event if you're able to come if you're on the east coast it, it's a good one um and then we go to denver with the irt uh jim heiser graciously invited us back the world doubles so LPRT, IRT singles, and then the men and women will pair up for exciting mixed doubles, which, I mean, that's been a lot of fun so far in, in, in the different events that we've had, Denver and New York. Um, and after that, we go back to uh, Randy Root uh, is, is agreed to host us again um, in June. Incredible. So we will end our modified season, thanks to COVID, in, back in Kansas. So when you when you end the season back in Kansas, TJ, is that going to be it's it's you're going to have the ranking year end ranking based on just what we've had so far? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So well, can, Kansas, Kansas, and two grand two other Grand Slams. Any thought to uh, you know having the season start at the beginning of of the year here in 2021 and then extending all the way through? December 2021, kind of like what tennis does, you know, both on the women's and men's tours. Yeah, um, you know, it, it was discussed briefly, but it, I think we just kind of fell into, it has been done this way for so long, we, we stuck with it. It was kind of the season went like the school year in the US from, from late August till early June, and we just stuck with that. Yeah. It's, it's funny, you know, it's funny, Ellie, because TJ, we don't, a lot of times we don't even talk about what we're going to ask, but that's a question. And, you know, I speak with Mike Grizz often too, mm -hmm. and I'm a big fan of like us going to a January to December calendar year. And so what if what we used to do, right? I mean, that doesn't always work. It's if it can be done. Yeah, I'd say why. I mean, why do you think we should be calendar year? You know what, TJ? That's a good question. I, I <laughs> I, I I haven't Ellie Ellie has more knowledge on that one than I do. I mean I think I think it could go either way. So I, I don't think there's a wrong answer to it. I I just think yeah, you, that you know there's uh you know just just the naturalness of a year just within the year and it's that year and then you restart whether it's you know right in January right away. You know that's the question with racquetball because it is played a lot in bad weather areas during those bad weather moments instead of being outside. Whereas in California, we're a little different. We kind of play year round in the same type of way because the weather isn't that bad ever outside. So, um, you know, the, it's, and, and then if you go that direction, then you're right in line with other racket sports and not that we're competing with tennis at all, or even able to be in that realm, but it's something natural feels good about it. But I also see what you're talking about. It's been done this way for a long time. Uh, IRT still, it. IRT still doing it this way as well. You know, no real need to change it. We're our own identity. But I was just curious really more than anything because it's, you know, now during COVID is a time to restart and rethink some things. And, and, uh, and, and you know, within the health club industry in general, there might be different things going on that um, are going to be in place for a while here. And, sure. Uh, I, so, I mean, I know. guess for some of us that live in the mid to northern part of the country, summertime was a time for outdoor too. So some right. of the players do play outdoor. So what about any, any synergy there? How do you feel about that? About, you know, I know Ellie loves the idea of having professional outdoor events tied in with the, you know, the indoor. What do you think about that teacher? I, I am a full supporter of outdoor racquetball. I love it. I, I really think there's a really important place 
four outdoor rack above because there are so many courts closing and because they're so um, because you have to have a membership to get into a health club as opposed to the local public courts at the outdoor you know at the public park that kids could ride their bike to and and they just need a racket and, and ball etc mm -hmm. um, we support it I mean the LPRT we're starting to do uh, we, we will start to do an outdoor ranking system. Um, mm -hmm. We fully support the Las Vegas event. And hopefully, we were hoping to be a, a part of Beach Bash this year, but unfortunately, it got canceled. Um, but we're going to look for ways to add outdoor events and, and have a presence in outdoor, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I was in Vegas, Ellie, and, and TJ, I felt that the LPRT, you, you, you did a kick-ass job. I mean, to me, it was the premier organization of the event. You know, I know you were you were streaming the main the main matches and everything, but as far as just presence, it felt like the LPRT was it was kind of like an LPRT outdoor event, which which is which was cool. Good. It's good to hear that. I mean, we hope to do better. I mean, you know, coming from our perspective, there's always things to do better and and we hope to have a bigger, bigger presence and you know, we, we want to support outdoor and and like like i said in my my article we want to support the other organizations and vice versa we hope they support the ladies yeah i'm sure you know there's there's good synergy there especially with the vegas event um mm -hmm. you know and sudsy knows that i love the idea of multiple surfaces and different styles of racquetball being uh encompassed into a professional uh, ranking situation like the LPRT. So, you know, I, I like that idea and I like it for singles. I know doubles is the main event outside and I get that and that can be also encompassed in all of it, but it brings in new possibilities, different styles of players that play outdoor only into the, the concept of being professionals at what they do. And then if they want to transition into the indoor game then and see where they're really at with the all around game, then they then they can. And it and it rewards the all around players that you have on tour already because you have a lot of them right now. You know, talk a little bit about your excitement for the level of play and the different players coming from all over different countries right now. They're, they're amazing. I mean, I, I hope those of you watching at home do follow along and get to know the players because they really are. They're so talented. I know them on and off the court. So, and I like that. I mean, I just like the players so much. They're just such great personalities. They're hard workers. The competition is to me, the best I've ever seen the tour. And it starts in early rounds. They're, they're tough. And some of these young players up and coming are just, they're working so hard and they're just, you, you could see them you know, getting their foot in the door, doing a little better and, uh, each time and then of course you you've got Paola I mean what else can you say about her she's she raised the bar for women's professional racquetball she she sure. set a new bar she continues to do that because she works so very hard yeah she yeah. does she does and and one of the things that you know the ladies do on the tour which I think is is not even close to matched by anyone else. And I'm not just talking IRT, I mean, in general, their social media presence is outstanding. So is that something that you and the LPRT work with them? Or are they pretty much on their own? And what we as fans and players see is them just doing their thing? Um, some of both. I mean, they definitely, they're on, they're on a lot. And, and we try to manage that a little more uh i think they're more likely to just grab their phone and post like random things and and there are th things i've done recently where i've tried to kind of facilitate it or organize it and it, maybe not as successfully maybe i need to try a new approach to that at events we're doing really good um maripa maria paz uh Riquelme, it does a really good job interviewing the players uh, before and after she's really creative um things like that the i don't know if you caught our boss bitch challenge that we did uh the players were all into that i mean it was just a if you if you haven't seen it then you need to go to our facebook page and see it it was just creative it's the players having a good time um there's always room for improvement for anything, of course. Uh, we, we recently brought on Amy uh, Roller, 
um, onto our contributing team to, to manage some of our social media. So, so hope, hopefully we'll pump that up even more. But, uh, it's a process. Talk a little bit about, um, you know, the upcoming schedule, 2021, 2022, and what you can work on at this stage of COVID, you know, feels like we're a little closer to coming out of, uh, you know, being stuck, not having events at all. So uh, you got any info on that? Um, as far as schedule goes, uh, there are a couple things. Uh, of course, the U.S. Open's on our schedule already. Um, you know, we, we have Vegas on our schedule. There's a couple other events. Uh, you know, Mexico, we're usually in Mexico the end of August. Uh, and we'll just have to see with, with the IRF schedule what, what happens there. And uh, hopefully we'll be back in San Luis Potosi uh, end of August. Um, and a couple other things that are just in the works. Chicago will be there again for the Turkey shootout in, in um, November. So uh, some good things uh, and some other ones that are, you know, it's been a tough year for sponsors too for COVID. So it's just, it's uh, the it's local- a fluid situation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. And if we, you know, as we try to bring in money for the LPRT, some of that will go to help those local tournaments. If we can, we can help secure an event, then, then we'll do that. Any, All any, right, Tej. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'll keep going. I mean, you know, any, go ahead, any, go ahead. any communications with, with the uh, tournament directors in the various cities in Bolivia and other, you know, South American countries, even, even some of the Central American company countries as well. And how do you facilitate that communication? I mean, are you speaking Spanish? Is it, uh, you have somebody helping you with that. <laughs> I mean, it's difficult because I, you know, having been involved in that that area in the past, it's it's not always just smooth. And you know, sure. you, you know, I'm sure there's interest there. Yes, for sure. Uh, well, when it comes to Mexico, I mean, Paula is our biggest resource. Um, right, she has all course. the connections, and we work with Paula to to make those happen. Um, very fortunately, when we went to Bolivia, uh, Jasmine um, Saba. Uh, she and I had, and her and her husband Nicholas had talked at the U.S. Open the year before, and they both speak. Their English is, is sure, fine. Sure. Yep, yep, Jasmine's obviously yep. like working on hers, but um, that was an easy process. And it, a lot of times, these events start with a player from the tour. Um, it just starts that way, and that's how the conversations, you know, the players are there. They're on the ground. They're they're in their cities. They know what courts. Are available. They may even know some sponsors that are interested in in hosting an event. That's that's most often that's where it starts. All right. So a big topic, which you know was your statement not too long ago, um, and and we're definitely you know we have to talk about that. There, mm -hmm. There's difference of opinions. Uh, mm -hmm. We want to really see where you're coming from on this on this one. So Scotty, can you pop up that statement on the screen real quick? So Tej, I'm going to just read, you know, your your three points. Uh, we'll start with the first point and then let you respond and we'll talk about it real quick. So number one, uh, after you kind of just stated how the, the LPRT runs and the type of organization, you know, we got to, it says, number one, support the LPRT's journey for equity in the sport by providing fair and equal main court playing time streaming at any major events in which both the IRT and LPRT are represented. So break it down. Give yeah. me the cliff notes. Well, I, I would say this, my, my purpose in writing this was really to start the conversation and make sure that the ladies have a voice in the conversations. I noticed a lot of people were writing about the tour um, and I wanted to make sure that we were part of the conversation that we also, you know, I have some pretty strong opinions about what I think needs to happen. And, and I just wanted to share them. Nothing against anybody or anything that has happened before or any other organization, but as far as equity, it, it's, it's a battle for the players, not at every event, but it certainly, needs to be better. I mean, a lot of sports, a lot of women's sports fight for the same thing. Tennis had to do it. They worked very hard in women's professional tennis to get equity for fair play time, for main court time, and, and for uh, prize money. They had to fight for it. So as we move forward, as things may change throughout 
events or as uh, as the sport itself changes, uh, as it, it, it has to, it will, um, I just want to make sure that the LPRT is supported in those things. It's important. Yeah. I yeah, I don't. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't think it's just the sport. I think we see it in society. I think that sports in general. There's so many changes that are happening, you know, daily. You touched on it, but and before I get to your second point, what what was your motivation, drive, and reason to release this statement at this time? Was there was there any specific thing that happened or took place? There was a lot of things. Uh, I mean, really, I was reading a lot about what other people were writing about the tour and i'm like well wait a minute that's not exactly right that's not what we think that's and i just said you know what just to start this conversation or just to be a part of it let me write let me put this down let me write and and this this isn't the only one i'll do i i really feel like i have a lot of ideas here that i'd like to start not just my opinion, but hopefully it starts other conversations with other organizations about how we do this better. It's all, all right, about so getting better and improving across the board. Absolutely. Oh, I agree. So, okay. Number two, it says support equity and prize money at any major event in which both IRT and LPRT are represented. Yes. Pretty clear. Go statement. ahead. Get yeah, it's, no, it, 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 is, it is pretty clear, but tell us, you know, where has that not happened and give us some, some history on that. Well, or, uh, it, give the players. It, yes. It, and again, I'm, I'm saying this as we move forward. Uh, I, I will also, I commend uh, Jim Heiser for uh, even helping us, helping mm -hmm. the Denver event evolve a little bit. Um, equal prize money will be in Denver for for men and women, um, and two championship courts where side by side, where the men will be on one, the women will be on the other one, equal set of bleachers. It, it's good progress. And as I make the statement, I wanna make sure that other events are following suit. Um, and, you know, historically the US Open has not been overly fair for the women players. And going forward, we will probably see the US Open change a little bit. It's gonna have, you know, after Doug's last year, it's gonna have some new management. It may change cities, locations, you know, we don't know, but let's be ready for that. And let's make sure this is fair. It's equal. I think a lot of people are interested in knowing like, you know, what, what that amount is, what, you know, what the minimum amount is for the IRT and then, you know, you know, the LPRT as well, since you want it to be equal at, and I agree that not only should prize money get to that equal status, difficult for tournament directors, I'll admit being on that end as well. And, and you know that, um, but you know, what's that minimum amount so that people can kind of take that in here on the show and in their areas, visualize what it'd be like to have the women's pros at their home facility, uh, especially if it if it's a facility that can facilitate some nice, uh, you know, streaming play. Okay. So a tier one inside of the U.S. is fifteen thousand. Uh, that's singles and doubles for for the LPRT. A Grand Slam is a minimum in the U.S. of twenty thousand dollars. Okay. That's and that would that's just for singles and then they can choose, a tournament director could choose to add doubles or not. That's up to them. So I, I, I have a silly question. And Ellie, you're a tournament director. TJ, you know, you're the commissioner of the LPRT. I know that the IRT's minimums are higher. So if you want equity, which by the way, I agree with, I think the prize money should be equal. Um, I'm all for that. You know, as my wife said the other day, she's like, we train the same, we play this, you know, and like, I, I don't disagree with that. But if you're setting the minimum, why don't you just raise it, right? Like that is that, and, and maybe this is ignorant what I'm saying, but if if the IRTs is 17.5 or 18, whatever it is, why don't you just raise yours? It, and part of the process, yes, uh, it, ours used to be 12. So uh, it, we gradually raised it to 15. And rather than our grandfathered in events that have, <clears throat> you know, supported us at a certain amount, we just make sure that we uh, are at least getting 
15 and at some point it will go up. Uh, uh, saying that though, and having, having a tournament director that wants to host both tours, there's no reason why, there's no reason for that difference. It's a minimum, right? It's a minimum. So if so, you're going to have both, go ahead. you know, make, make the prize money equal. Yeah. And on that note though, you know, that, that for tournament directors and for the cities in, in general, you know, having both means obviously more money, raising more money. And we know that we understand that. And so, you know, how, how connected are you to the IRT right now and how much communication are you having as tours? You know, because it almost seems like there's a feeling of wanting to merge together a little bit. I'm not saying that within as a company, but as connections towards, you know, events that, you know, you know, you know, pinpointing events that can host both and having that there, because I know the mixed doubles is exciting. I think there's a solid future for that. Like I'm really interested in watching that and, and the singles events are nice to go with it, but the mixed doubles could get really exciting, you know, with the level of play right now on the women's right. tour. Right. And uh, the styles of play maybe match up really nicely right now between the men and the women and, and, yeah. uh, you know, and all that. So, well, I, I mixed doubles, I think is something new. It's something different. Do I think that it needs to be at every single event? No, but I think that makes it special when you do have it. Uh, the couple events, it was something different. It, it was a very popular, um, fan engaged, uh, event. I mean, people really tuned in to watch mixed doubles because it was different. You know, as far as us working with the IRT, I've gotten to know uh, Mike Grizz, CEO of the IRT very well. We talked a lot. We talked a lot about what's best. We talk, uh, we just have conversations um, and it's, it's good. It's good progress to, right. to, to even how can we work together for the best for both tours and what can we do that would benefit both both of us and i said that was one of the reasons we started a, a collaboration just in marketing just just if nothing else sharing our each other's uh matches speeds semifinals, finals um our logos our links that kind of things just just to start well, it doesn't mean a full merger but it's it's just working together <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and, and you know, when you when you compare it to a tennis situation, I mean, we're excited to see the events that have both the men's and women's are the Grand Slam events, of course, and the several others, you know, in the 1000 levels that have that, that feature as well. And it's, you know, it's fun to see sometimes the women's match be in the prime time second, the last match on of the night and the men, you know, uh, are right before them and lead into that. So I think that feature can happen at events, especially when you have a Paola who can play that last match feature match, uh, you know, and, and, you know, be, be the one to, to stay up for really at the event, uh, so to speak. So it's interesting, you know, and I think that's going to become a lot, uh, you know, which cities can facilitate, which areas can facilitate as we get back to normal here and have events, men's and women's professional players, there, professional tours there. So, you know, I'm, I'm curious about that. You know, I'm curious about that. It is yeah, a lot of money. <laughs> I, I, I haven't, I mean, I, I'm just, I'm just listening truly. And, and one thing I know about you and Mike Grizz at the IRT, you definitely both want to do what's best for the sport. And then me as a player fan, and I've worn many hats in my long time lifespan of, of you know, in, in racquetball, I would love to see, now please don't take this wrong. I'm not saying you should merge. I'm saying that I would love to see the men and women at every single event you know, we're very small. There's not that many events. And I believe there are some strength in numbers. Um, in, and, and then listening to what you're saying, I don't disagree. I think the money should be the same. And I'm like, well, well, yeah. I mean, if, if we, let's say the IRT or the men went into Stockton, California, and we were together with the women, well, if Ellie wants to have the, the tournament or the event, yeah, then he's got to double the prize money. Now it's almost like strength in numbers, right? And then Ellie says, well, I'm not doing it. Then we say, okay, well, here are your options. It's almost like a satellite tour, right? So, I mean, if that could happen, and I know there's a lot more behind the scenes that it's just not that simple. Is, is it possible that we might see that where we always see the men and women together or... Oh, I mean, you said it, John, you said it best. I mean, you put both tours there and it's double the prize money. It's a lot of money. So do I think every location is going to do that? Do every, do I think every location has the number of courts to host that many people in an event? No. Uh, 
um, I don't. And it doesn't mean that we can't be separate. The benefit that I see to doing both is together, yeah, is creative events like the mixed doubles and it is a massive numbers like the US Open, a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Bolivian Open is a good example. But having, for example, the LPRT at a local event where it's just them, the fans really interact with the players so much and the players really stick around and they, they get to know and those fans become followers. And that's good for the tour. Doesn't always happen when the tours are together. Not that it shouldn't, but it doesn't always happen that way. Yeah, that I mean that's that's a that's a an individual personality thing. You know, I think we we've talked about that. How yeah. to how the players can maximize their marketability, their likability. You know, that's you can't take somebody that's maybe an introvert and say, Hey, I need you to go palm press or or speak to sponsors and fans and supporters. So let me get to number three of your point and then we'll 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 move on. All right. So number three, you said support the organization of the LPRT as it is established. It is the only organization under the racquetball umbrella that is committed to promoting women's professional racquetball. Although combining the two professional tours could be beneficial structurally, i.e. shared expenses. And from a marketing perspective, the overall merger could fail the women's tour with respect to equity and the spotlight our athletes so need to be successful. We need only to look at the history of women's racquetball for this. So I'll say that the history of women's racquetball verse today obviously is completely different. And, you know, the mergers and the shared expenses. Now, if I'm the IRT, I'm sitting here going, well, hell, I'd love a Randy Root too. Can we come and share that prize money? Right? So that comes into play also. So talk a little bit about number three and then, you know, just see where we're at. Uh, well, number three, again, it comes back to when I, when I sat down to write this and I'm thinking about what does support for the LPRT look like? And, and really those were the three major things that really, and wearing an LPR t-shirt doesn't, LPR t-shirt helps too, of course. And John, I'll send you one if you want one. That would be nice, uh, <laughs> that would be nice. <laughs> I had to beg Momo for this. I think he charged me for it. <laughs> I would have sent you, uh, just give me your size on me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but um, it, right now, it, we've worked very hard as far as the structure of the LPRT goes, there's a lot of good people behind the scenes and a lot of people working for the betterment of the women's tour of women's professional racquetball that I don't feel like a lot of people already knew. I, I don't know that a lot of people knew how we operate or how we've um, evolved and are now established. And uh, you know, I, and I, fortunately, I do read some of the social media comments after some of the articles that have been out, and I see all this, oh, yeah, they need to be, oh, yeah, the RT just needs to take the LPRT and, you know, just market them, and all. there's more to it than that, and that that's my point, is of we're, course. we're evolving, we've got a really good team of people working for, with the LPRT, and you know, a little support goes a long way for something like that. Mergers don't always, aren't always for the best reasons. And when mergers do happen, uh, it, it really has to be the right situation for both parties involved. Can't disagree with that. <laughs> no, no doubt about that. Ellie? Yeah, no, point number four. Let's continue on here. No, no, that that's, that's it. Those were that's the three it. points. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Yeah, I, it's, uh, I agree with it. It seems like you're just putting it out there and letting people uh, see that and just uh, take that in and, and go from there. And if you want to support uh, women's racquetball, women's professional racquetball, then then there's there's ways to go about that. Obviously, you know, as someone who's hosted a women's pro stop in the past, and you know, I know where to start. And uh, and and uh, you know, and it all generally comes down to money. That right now, when it comes down to popularity of tours i think women right now when it comes to this area there's probably a little more demand for the women's store than the men's store and i'm saying that having had guys that come right out of our club but they know this as well you know there's something about having the women's store there that a, a lot of you know it's just it's a uh, it's great for a lot of different racquetball players in the local area and then if you can stream that event out there then you know great great recognition for your facility host facility and everybody involved so you know, it's certainly on our minds right now, and it'll be interesting coming out of this COVID period and saying, okay, what do we want to do now as 
as racquetballs redeveloped and regrouped within the InShape brand where I'm at, you know, uh, and, you know, having a revisit to those topics, to, to those days that weren't that long ago, TJ. So I'm sure you're having these types of uh, conversations all over the United States right now. And sure. hopefully a tour develops for 2021, 2022. That's uh, significant. We get past it, whatever stage this is at. Right. And, you know, oh, go no, go ahead, TJ. No, no, you go I was going to say, you mentioned Randy Root being, I mean, gosh, we are so grateful to have, I mean, my goodness. The whole sport is. <laughs> yes. It, uh, it, I can't even, I tell him all the time, because I don't have enough words to say thank you to him for the support he's given the women's tour. Uh, and we're grateful for it. Um, you know, the IRT has support like that too. They have the event, mm -hmm. they have a big event in Wisconsin, I think it is. Is it Milwaukee? I don't know. It's a North, big event. North Dakota. North Dakota. North North Dakota. Dakota. Is that I think that's one? the one you're talking about. Yeah. Okay. I think that's. Yeah. So, I mean, it's okay to have the, that separate support, but, you know, the other thing I mentioned in the article, how, how great would it be if we really had these, you know, four majors where both tours came together, the U.S. Open, uh, the Denver World Doubles, the Bolivia Open, and, and something else, <laughs> Mexican Open or whatever it is how great would that be if we had those four majors where the sport actually comes together? That's possible. That's real. That, yeah, I think that would be great for everybody. And, and this is also, I see some tournament directors that are watching. So this question is for TJ, you and Ellie as big tournament directors, and I'll give my own opinion and I'd love to hear, you know, what some of the fans and players say. So let's say we're at an event and we have this where we're trying to put equal matches, you know, men, women, men, women, men, women. How do you, I, well, I feel strongly about this. I feel that the event directors should be able to make decisions that they believe is in the best interest of the event slash sport. Here's an example. We're going men, women, men, women, men, women. And Kane is about to play a qualifier who got through the draw and he's, you know, whatever level he might be. And it's, it's time for a men's match. But TJ, you have this spectacular matchup in the round of 16s that's about to go in the backcourt with Gabby Martinez because she has a low ranking and Samantha Salas in an early round. But we're at that, you know, equal match play now. I believe that the event director should always have final say of what's the decision in the best interest of the event. So TJ... I'll ask you first, what are your thoughts on that? And I'd love to hear, like I see Robert Lyons in there. You know, how do you feel about that? Well, I, I can, I would say that fairness can come, come across still being what's best for the event. And if you ask Paola uh, and Samantha and Maria, there are early rounds where, not, where I go to Samantha or Paola and I say, look, I don't think this match is gonna be a really good match. <laughs> so I and so I'd like to put you on court two. We'll try to pop in with the stream, but we have this other match that would be really good for us to stream. Are you okay with that? And usually, yeah, yeah, it's fine. So we end up we try to pick a match that's going to be very competitive. So you said you, you said usually there. So when it's not that usually moment, and they say no, I want the work on this glass court here because I know I'm going to be playing there and I want that extra work. How, that's how the U.S. That Open. Official, happens, what's the official situation well, there? Because, yeah, that's a topic do, all the time. We throw another camera or phone on, the, on another court so it's still being streamed. Right. Right? I mean, so the, play, the top seed's going to win over if they need it because that feels like the right thing to do and it has for a long time. And, right. yeah, and, you know, as, and, and Sudsy's bringing up another. And that's we, – we played under tour decided matches where they go higher ranked, always got the say-so. And, and that was understood, but not always believed to be correct deep down. Like we kind of knew, yeah, there's some other matches that might be better than our round of 16 match here or round of 32 match back in the day. So, you know, yeah, that's a, it's interesting. So you say, you know, a tournament director decision or tour decision, I think that it's should be a combination of all parties kind of communicating during an event like that. That's the best scenario. And really trying to make a decision based off of what really will be the most exciting event match to have on at that time. If you're not pre-setting, you know, predetermining because you know, who's going to be in that spot. Like I know Powell is going to make it through the round of 32s and 16s to have this spot. Although 
you know, nothing's a given in the round of 16s for anybody at, at this stage with this many good players. But yeah, you know, it's, I think it should be a group decision. I think the tournament yes. director should really have a lot to say about that. You know, so if you're saying, well, make an official call. Yeah, I'd lean towards the tournament director, having been on both sides of it. As a player, I would not have cared as much, me personally, but I'm a nice guy, so oh, I, it I, didn't matter. I was, I'd be pissed. I mean, back in the day when I was number one and TJ, you know, Hank would come over and be like, so you got to go. I'd be like, what do you mean? I got to go play. You know, I, I didn't like it, but it took me years to understand the benefits. Mike Locker, what's up, Lock? He's chiming in and he makes a good point here. He says that players have sponsors to represent too. So it's important for the players to get that exposure on the show courts. Yeah, Lock, I don't disagree, except that, right, to, to the point being is that we kind of feel that player is going to get that exposure anyway. So if we're telling Paolo or Keen or, or Ellie to move in the Let's back. Let's be honest, though. We're talking generally about the three, four seed and the five, you know, maybe, maybe the seven, six, five, six seed, seven, eight seed, you know, three from the three on up, not the one and two. They're yeah, generally, you're going to want those on the main court because their matches go quick too. So you can, you can go bang, <laughs> bang with another match. Usually. I mean, that's real. That's reality. Well, they want to well. be, they want to be seen, which is, you know, TJ, you're absolutely right. You know, Paola yeah. is a machine in herself and she's got to yeah. be there. Kane's got to be there, you know, but, but it does come up and, and I just, it's something that I've always thought of. You know, I think I've matured over the years and I realized that there there needs to be what's in the best interest of the sport and the event versus what's in the best interest of the player, because we're just we're, we're just a tiny sport and we're still trying to, you know, make that leap. Right. And COVID and did not help. I think there go, there's a lot to be said for uh, before the event happens, making the effort to schedule uh, a reasonable um if there is one championship court, a reasonable flow of, of men's and women's matches. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And it's doable. It's doable. If you have, you know, if you have a good court that you can, regardless if you don't have enough courts for a bigger tournament with amateurs involved, uh, you know, if you have, if you have one court, you really have enough for pros for both pro tours to probably handle it in a day. You know, obviously two, three courts makes it really doable. Um, you know, one last, one last thought I have is, you know, during this time and as we come back from COVID, is there any efforts towards trying to put on little mini events where you have certain players in the top eight, top 16 that are willing to become, you know, be a smaller group of pros involved in an event and playing different, maybe with some amateurs, having, having a small mini tournament amongst themselves, uh, you know, doubles matches, but also including other amateur players from certain areas. I know there could be a demand for that. Yeah, I mean, organized by the tour specifically, no, but I regularly get asked by tournament directors, hey, I have a local pro here and we just, we want her to play in this event, but she's top six, or we would, we'd like to bring another pro in. Um, so what we do is uh, we work with a tournament director to do an LPRT exhibition. You know, Hank Marcus did that in, in Portland last year. Um, first weekend is in December and mm -hmm. it was great. I mean, Holly right. Scott, Rhonda Rezich, um, a couple other players, local players got to play and it was an exhibition and hopefully that exhibition turns into a tier one event. That, that's certainly a possibility. I've done that with Chad Bailey in, in Florida as well. Um, it's, it's, we're, I mean, I would say I'm, I personally am open to creative ideas. It's good exposure for players. If it gives the local player a little money, if, uh, if Rhonda could get an appearance fee or, or any other players, great. Yeah, that's some great. potential streaming content too would be nice, sure. you know, and this, as we come out of COVID, and that's kind of where my thoughts are that maybe, you know, certain areas would have to kind of graduate into full stops by having these little smaller uh, one-off events where you have several yes. pros. And, you know, I mean, Sudsy and I did it. Occasionally, whether it was satellite tour stuff or just, uh, you know, exhibition style events that were fun. And and um, now we just didn't have video on at the time, obviously. <laughs> and now everything. Thank God. Through, so. Some of the times, Ellie. Uh, yeah, know. just just we, we we preach it. You know, TJ, everybody, all you players out there, just get out there, you know, like share the feeds. TJ, you and I spoke about it. This is about racquetball. This isn't about LPRT only or Sudsy or Ellie or, or just get it out there. Just push it out. You know, anything that you can just, just show the sport content and more content. Some of the players do a great job. Some not so great. That's okay. You know, if, if I could ever help you personally, Ellie, TJ, the tours, you know, we just want racquetball out there. TJ, you know, LPRT, we love you. 
uh, hopefully, I'm trying to find a mixed doubles partner for uh, for Denver. So, Ooh. you know, mm. if I could if I could get one, you know, there's a good chance I'm I'm going to play. There's a lot of speculation, and Momo from Formula Flow uh, just he just sent text me. He said give away five shirts. So um, let's give away five shirts. Your choice at Formula Flow. So we're gonna take the I don't know. I don't know, Teej, you got any ideas? Let's give away, Ellie, what do we got? How are we gonna give away these five shirts? Gotta give them away somehow. And we're gonna engage the fans. Guess who I'm playing with? How about that? I'm still not gonna tell you, but you give good answers. I thought you didn't have a partner, but you could do some LPRT trivia. Like, um, all right, we'll do a quick one because we gotta we gotta let you go. I'll tell okay. you what, uh, you go, you give the question then because you. I know you uh, know some anything okay. you want. Name the two players from Guatemala. That's a good one. Players from right. Guatemala. First person to answer that gets a free formula flow shirt. TJ, if you're not here, we'll pay attention and we will get them the shirt. All, all right. right, Ellie, give us a trivia question. Trivia question. On yep. the spot trivia question for Go. LPRT. Um, for a Formula Flow shirt. What was the last event that Paola did not win? Whoa. That's, that's, that's a event. great question. I don't know. the J.D. Shelton, you win the Formula Flow shirt. All right. You got that. J.D. Shelton came up first with Marie Renee and Gabby Martinez. Um, all right. I got one. Who was the LPRT commissioner before TJ? Is that a real question? I don't even know. Is that a legal question? Or who ran the women's tour before? Yeah. Yeah. Who was the who was the women's professional commissioner prior to TJ? TJ, can you text me that answer? I think I know. <laughs> All right. All right. We're, we're going to have to let you go now, TJ. Okay. Um, thank you, guys. We, we will be back uh, because Ellie and I are going to go do some videos. We thank you so much for being here. We will have you back, and we will have some of your players back as Good. well. We, we always enjoy it. So Don't thanks for being here. No, Thank no, you you're so great. Much. Thank you. We'll see, you. we'll see you soon, all right, TJ? Thank you, guys. Thanks, John. Thanks. Take care, TJ. Thanks. Take care. Ellie, we're going we're gonna to hit some. We're going to hit. Scotty, can, are those videos loaded up? We got some videos from some of the fans, and then we'll close it out with our thoughts uh -huh. on the show. But okay. I think it's important. Let's get to the first video. Question from one of the fans. What's up, guys? Julius Ellis here. All right, Suds and John Ellis. What is your guys' favorite match you've ever played? Can be on the tour or just like for fun? Yeah. Yeah, they're acting up again. Can we hear those questions, Scotty? I, I we don't know. Didn't hear. Oh, it. and it's going quick too. Is this, do we have an issue here with the video questions? <laughs> All right. All right. Next so week. Te Next week. Techni technical difficulties, everybody. This happens in the show. You know, Scotty Max working hard back there. We got, we did get some video questions that we're excited to play. As you can see, there was one. I think I recognize that first one, Julius Ellis. I saw Annie Roberts also. Um, I'll so tell you, Suds, you know, cool. they're having an opportunity to practice a little bit here in in Lodi, California, in the, in the town next to Stockton. So, um, you know, small practices, only two on a court at a time. But uh, Jose Diaz is involved a little bit, playing with the kids and working with the kids this Saturday. And, and um, you know, so they – they I asked them to do it. I didn't, I only expected one or two, maybe, maybe my kids. And uh, others jumped on board and, and had some good questions. So, you know, hey, they're pretty real questions too. So we'll hopefully hear them next week because I, it's a kickstart for a lot of people out there who might have some questions about racquetball. We're looking to – you know, just kind of get the, the listeners and the viewers involved in, in this show here and, and uh, take on some racquetball questions on, in any, any, you know, any way, shape, or form. It's no problem. So uh, looking forward to that. Yeah, keep it coming. All right, so Ellie, let's recap the show. So, you know, first we had the USAR, USAR um, candidates to be on the board. You know, what are your <laughs> yeah, thoughts? Yeah, you know, hey, it's nice letting see, putting – putting uh, faces to names and uh, letting them talk about it for a quick second. You know, I guess we could ask Todd a little bit, you know, he said money. What's the, what's the number one thing? Money. Okay. Next, <laughs> you know, we didn't really dig in on that very much, but you know, we all know that, you know, we all know that there's a money crunch in the sport that, you know, USA racquetball is connected to 
uh, the Olympic situation, the Olympic movement still, and there's, you know, money connections there, and there always have been, and then it's all, it's hard to get an outside industry business involved in the sport, and uh, you know. Did you ever run for a board position? No, I haven't. You know, and I, I you know, I'm probably not the personality type for that. Uh, I haven't even ran here in, in California. I, I I like doing. I like hosting events. I like obviously being involved in that aspect of racquetball. I like to ground groundwork stuff here with junior racquetball with kids who literally have never played the sport and walked into the club and with their parents to sign up and take a tour of the club and said, oh, my God, look at that racquetball program going on there. And then next thing you know, they're a part of it. So, you know, that's how Jody Nance started it here and had the first the Rojas family and the Diaz family and Aldana's and all that stuff here. Uh, I was before that time. So, you know, that's being a part of that. I enjoy that more than than certain other aspects of being involved in the political part of it. So, uh, you know, I know you've had some experience in it with the past, so I'm sure you have feelings about having these four on. And then uh, what about you? Yeah, I mean, I'm, you know, I, I the process is is still for me a little bit suspect at the, you know, at the least. Um, I understand, you know, committees are volunteers. Uh, they work hard. But uh, and, and I understand that vetting happens. But at the end of the day, you know, we're a super small sport. I don't think there's that many people that put their name forward to be on a board. Uh, I think it would be nice for, for the players, you know, to be able to vote whoever they want, whoever they think would best represent them in the sport, you know, as a board member on USA Racquetball. But that's just me. I mean, so I have, you tried, have you tried to be on the board in the past? I mean, have you, have you tried to submit to the committee? I did, yeah. Whoever the committee ago. is, the committee? <laughs> yeah, a few years ago I did, Ellie. I did um, – I did. <laughs> I did put my name through and uh, I got a phone call that my name will not even be put uh, onto the slate to be voted on. And uh, it was suggested to me that I could go get 200 signatures from active USAR members. And I felt that that was a slap in the face of not just to me, I was just disappointed with our sport, you know, in that sense that a committee, whoever it was at the time decided that, you know, I shouldn't even be put on the slate to allow board members to vote whether or not they think I'd be a good representative, you know, for, for a spot. So I'll leave it at that. You know, obviously, you know, a little more and there's a lot I could say, but you know, I don't want to say anything too bad or too negative. So let's, let's move on from that and say, get out and vote. You got about a month to vote. I know Ellie wants me to talk a lot more. I'm sure Scotty does too, but I won't. And uh, TJ, you know, I think TJ, listen, TJ loves, loves women's racquetball. She's been doing it for a long time. She's doing the best she can. I would still love to see a merger type thing happen because I think for the sport, it would be better right now, the current state. I don't know if I agree hundred percent. I don't really, you know, it doesn't matter to me either way. It's all about the city and whether they want to raise the money to, uh, to have both tours there and have an event that's special like that because the, Hey, they would be, that's the reality. If you have the courts to make it happen and you have some, some some sponsor dollars, some uh, some racquetball lovers that can uh, you know can donate to the sport because that's what it is. Sometimes let's be really honest. You know, I know we're streaming yeah, events, but, we got, like, but I understand. You know, we got to change that mentality and all that. And right. I work hard. As a tournament director, you go you work hard for that because if you don't believe in it, you're not going to raise enough money to actually be able to host the event. So I, I I understand both sides of it, but the reality is a lot of the a lot of the sponsors for me that have decided to sponsor events are really donating because they love racquetball and they want to be a part of that. And they want to see the matches up close and the front seats to be really honest with you. So, you know, I see it both ways, Suds, and that's just the reality, but Hey, you know, it's special to have the abilities to raise that much money and have both tours there. And I hope that's an emphasis going forwards as we come out of COVID and we have events, we're not quite there yet. So this is all, you know, it feels a little early on talking about all this to some extent and having, TJ on and talking about, but she did make a strong statement there. You know, the equality of the sport. I'm all for that. I think it's, I think we're at the time in our Fine, society right? where, Hey, yeah, the, you know, let's put the women in the prime spot. The matches are going to happen anyways. You're going to watch them or not. You know, you're going to tune in, you're going to stream it. You're going to watch it. You're going to watch it later. That that's all there for us nowadays. So I think you can have it. Um, you know, I don't think the perception well, of the I, but you know what? Tour has to be highlighted over the women's tour every single moment of the event. I, I, I agree with you, and but one of the arguments I've heard is when you just mentioned streaming, if you look at the streaming numbers, viewers and stuff, it's kind of lopsided. And I'm not saying there should be, I think there should be equal prize money, 
you know, the women are amazing, the men are amazing, whatever happens, both of you tours, you know, uh, we're here to support you all. And uh, we want nothing but the best for every single player, everybody that watches. With that, you know, we're going to say thank you. Ellie, thank you so much. Scotty Mack, thank you. Veronica, thank you very much, my love. Keith Miner, KWM Gutterman, thank you for being an awesome sponsor. We appreciate it. And most of all, beyond the court, we thank you, the fans, the players, the supporters, and everybody and anyone that truly just wants to see what the best possible thing they can do to help our sport is. All right. With that, we'll see you next week. Episode number Larry Bird, 33, just came to mind. And uh, everybody have a great week. Look for a cool post uh, this week coming up. See you later.